passage is from the revelation given to the Apostle John. And as you notice in here, it's going to skip around a little bit to get a real uh, taste and a sense of the, uh, the whole story in this section of the revelation. It's going to be 4, 1 to 2, 5, 1 to 5, and 6, 1 to 11. But as it tells all printed correctly there in your bulletin. Uh, before we read this, let us pause for a moment in prayer. Good and heavenly Father, Lord, we come before your holy word. And Lord, today we are beginning to touch upon some of these deep mysteries uh, that you have presented to us in Scripture. And Father, we know we can understand none of the things you have given us, and uh, this most of all, without your Holy Spirit to guide us. And Father, not only do I ask today that your Holy Spirit to open these Scriptures to us and illuminate us, Lord, but... Be able to let us see those things we are meant to see, understand what we are meant to understand. And and those things we are not meant to understand, Lord, to leave to your grace and mercy. Lord, to leave to trust in you, knowing that all things will work according to your time and according to your purpose. And with the confidence to know, Lord, that we will understand as you have set us to. So, Father, I pray that you would bless this holy reading of your holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. After I read this, uh, we will have a brief moment of quiet meditation. This is a reading today from the book of Revelation. Listen now to the word of the Lord. After this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Then I saw in the right hand of of, of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! And out came another horse, bright red, Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, And do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed with him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by a wild beast of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. (laughs) 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. William Shakespeare once famously opined, all the world is a stage and the men and women merely players. And he gave us this this image of life being like a play, life being like a stage. And and when you're born, that's your cue to come on. And and you live your life, you have your lines, you, you, you play your part on the world stage. And then when we die, that's our exit. We're called out as others are called in and others leave along with us. Now, if you've ever been a part of the theater, if you ever worked in um, anything on the stage, you might have noticed that most of the action takes place off stage. That, that what you see as it's presented on the stage is, is the tip of the iceberg. That's just a small portion of what's going on. If you ever worked in a play, you'll, there's a whole flurry of activity behind stage. You've got the director and the, and the stage manager. They're, they're calling out commands. You've got people running behind to get to their place and this place. They're calling the actors in from the dressing room to get to their places. The guy on the curtain is moving the curtain. The man with the lights is working with the lights. They're having to put props on and off, replace the scenery. Just a whole buzz of activity that goes on behind the, sta- the surface. The stage, the stage is just the surface. The stage is just the very little bit that we see. And actually, the the, the power, or should I say maybe the authority, about what goes on on the stage doesn't come from the stage at all. The authority of what is happening on the stage and what we're seeing as the play goes on is from the people behind. The director, the stage manager, and the rest. This is the true authority of what we see in a play. It's all the movement and all the words spoken and all the things that are done backstage. So I think I think Shakespeare was right. I think Shakespeare gave us a very good analogy that the world is a stage and the men and women he calls us merely players. And and if the earth is the stage, then the real authority of what goes on in earth is not on the stage. It's not here on the earth, on the things that we see, that we experience, that we can hear and touch. The real authority is behind the surface, or should I say beyond the surface, And if if we could look behind the surface, we would see the real power. We would see the real authority that moves what we do here on earth. See, the real authority, I call it the backstage, but but in, in, in our words, it's the heavens. The heavens are that authority. And if we could look into these heavens... If we could get a moment, have a, have a door, so to speak, to peer behind and to go backstage and look into these heavens, we would see the real power. We would see the real authority. We would see the true genesis of all the things that happened here on this earth and all that truly moves this world. What we would see, if we look behind, is that God is, God was, and God always will be, the power behind world history. We would see that God is, God was, and God always will be the power behind world history. Now, you know, make no mistake, it is people that are acting. We're, we're the ones on the stage. But the true authority lies in the backstage. And yes, this is, if, if, if we were using the theater, theater analogy, this world and this earth is truly experimental theater. And if you've been to some experimental theater, it can be really, really bizarre sometimes. And this is probably the most experimental of experimental theater. Imagine, if you would, going to a play where the director has given the actors some general rules of what they should do, but no script. They've got no script. These are the things you should do. This is the way you behave. Now go on out there on the stage and play your part. 
Imagine what that would look like, right? Utter chaos. It would be crazy. It would be, it would be very confusing. You would think there'd be no purpose to it at all. Welcome to life. Welcome to life. God has put us out on the stage. He's given us scripture. He's given us his word. He's given us some guidance and direction. But he doesn't give us a script. But you've got to say this and you've got to say that. And this is just the stage. The real authority. The real power of world history is the will and the plan of God. Now what I like so much or what is so special about this book is that Revelation gives us a glimpse of the backstage. Not many, not many times do you get this, and even in the Bible, you don't always get a glimpse of what's going on backstage, but that's exactly what we get in this book. We get a glimpse of the heavens. We get a glimpse to see the power that is moving the power of the earth. And it starts in this reading in, in, in chapter 4, verse 1, that I started today. When, when John, the apostle, he's, he's, he's on this island, he's exiled, and he begins to have this vision. And this vision is what he writes down in the book of Revelation. But the vision begins when he says, I saw a door open up in heaven. So he's on the earth, but he sees the heavens, and he sees a door opens up, and a voice comes and says, come up here. And let me show you these things that must soon take place. And so John goes from the earth and he gets a glimpse into heaven to see what's going to take place. So John is taking us backstage with him. He's going to the backstage. He's going to go see all the inner workings, the things that are going on in heaven that are going to influence what is to come and happen here on earth. And we know that he's sitting at the seat of power because as soon as he goes into heaven, he's brought into the court of God. And God is sitting there on his throne. And he's before him and he sees, he sees elders all around God and he sees four living creatures. They're, they're circling around God and they're constantly singing praise and they're worshiping him. And it goes on forever and ever and ever, all this worship of God. So he is right there at the very seat of power the seat of power at the, at the backstage that moves and directs everything that happens here on our stage. And as John is watching this, he sees that, that, that God on the throne is, is holding in his hand a scroll. And it's just like a scroll, just this paper that's rolled up into a scroll. And he notices that it's written on the front and it's also written on the back. So this scroll is full of writing. There's lots of stuff written on it, and it's sealed with seven seals. Now, as, as you probably know, back in the day, that was the only way to secure. They didn't uh, secure a message is to, is, to, is to cover it with a seal. And, uh, you know, they didn't have encrypted, you know, uh, emails or information like that. The only way what they would do is you would, you would write a letter, and then you would fold it up. And on the place where it's folded together, where the two sheets come, you would drip some wax and then when, before the wax dried, you would have a metal impression with your seal on it. It was a picture, like usually a, you know, a sword or a lion or an eagle. And then you would stamp the wet wax. And when it dried, it had formed a seal. So you couldn't open the letter unless you broke it. And then once it was broken, you would know that someone had been reading your mail. So John's up in heaven, and he sees God holding this this scroll and it's sealed with these seven seals and we know it's important because it has been closed not with just one but with seven and in the ancient world it was a tradition that uh, the emperor's wills were always sealed with seven seals and anything really important was going to be sealed with seven so we know that this is a very important document whatever is written in it and as John is standing there in heaven this question goes out it says who can open this we have the scroll in the right hand of God, sealed with seven seals. Who is able to open this so we can read what's inside the seals? And there's a silence in heaven because nobody is worthy to open it. And so John even begins to weep because he knows this is important. He knows this is a big deal. And nobody is worthy to open it. So he starts to weep. And as he's weeping, a voice cries out and says, weep no more. Somebody is worthy to open up the scroll. And he sees a lamb 
It says a lamb comes forward. It has a wound that had been, he had been struck with this wound. And so we know that this lamb is Jesus. Jesus is the lamb of God. He was stricken, but he came back to life again. And the elders declare that here Jesus is the one that is worthy to open this seal. Because he has ransomed the world with his blood. Because he was obedient to God unto death. Here is somebody that is worthy to open this scroll of God. Now there are a lot of big mysteries in this book. In fact, you can say this is a book that's full of mysteries. And, and when you ask people which ones they find the most compelling... They'll probably always tell you that they want to know when this is going to happen. And they want to know who the beast is. And we'll get to the beast much, you know, a little bit later. Those are the big mysteries they want solved. When is this all going to happen? And who is this beast character that's going to persecute us? And how can I identify him? And those, a lot of times to us, are the most compelling mysteries of Revelation. But I don't think it's the most important mystery. I think the most important mystery we have is confronting us today. And the biggest mystery that we can answer out of this book is what is written on this scroll? We've got this scroll handed by God that only Jesus can open and is written inside and out, sealed with seven seals, but it doesn't tell us what is written on this scroll. But these contents are very important because it is the contents of the scroll that begin unfolding the apocalypse. It is the contents of the scroll that bring about the beginning of what we could say is the end or bring about, begin to bring about the end of the fulfillment of God's kingdom here on earth. In fact, it's so important what is written here that only Jesus Christ is worthy to open it. A lot of scholars I've written a lot of stuff about what is in this scroll. And most of them seem to think it has something to do with God's plan. Because it is, in fact, at the beginning of the vision of Revelation. This is, in fact, as these seals are broken, we start seeing the plan of God start moving into action at the end of time or maybe even in history. So people have begun to kind of agree that this is probably... God's plan for history. Maybe it is com the complete destiny of the world. It also could be the completion, the instructions for the completion of his kingdom. Some people have proposed that maybe on the scroll is written all the names of the people who are to be saved. Could be the full mysteries of God waiting to be unveiled. Some have even speculated that this might be the deed to the kingdom of God. Remember, it's common for wills to be sealed with seven seals. So maybe this is the deed to the kingdom of God given to Jesus. But whatever is in it, it's a very important unveiling. And we see as these seals are broken, it happens and in stages, and at each stage there's this huge event that shakes heaven and earth all at once. Now, when these four, four, first four seals are broken, we get the four horsemen. And these are the four horsemen that have captured the public imagination, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And um, it's an image that's been used in literature and movie once. There were even a group of wrestlers named themselves the four horsemen. Y'all remember those guys? I don't know. I might be the only one <laughs> that remembers the four horsemen, like Ric Flair and Arn Anderson and his brother. There was somebody else, Tully Blanchard, I think. Just, just forget I just even said any of that stuff. It's so not important. <laughs> but this is where the four horsemen originate. As, 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 he breaks, as Jesus breaks these first four seals, these four horsemen come riding out on the earth. And they've been called by God to ride out. Every time a seal is broken, there's a voice that's from heaven that calls the horse for it that says, Come, and the horse rides out. And there's a different impact on the world with every single horse that rides. And for instance, when, so when the first seal is broken, a white horse is called out. And it says that he was given a power to conquer. He's been given a crown and a bow when he goes out and he's given the power to conquer. And when he breaks the second seal, there's, there's a red horse that comes out. And it said this red horse was given authority to take peace from the earth. He was given a sword and there's going to be all this fighting that goes on and all this, this warfare in between people and nations and communities. 
And then he opens the, the third seal. And a black horse comes out, and he's, and he's holding scales. And we get this real cryptic message in here about the price of wheat. A denarius for a quart of wheat, a denarius for three quarts of barley, but do not harm the oil and the wine. And for 2,000 years, we've speculated on what in the world this means. And no one has any clear answer, but we do know that it's talking about these prices that are severely inflated. A denarius should buy much more than a quart of wheat. It should buy something like 16 quarts of wheat. And it's enough for a laborer to just barely feed his family. So what's happened with this third horse with the scales is we're seeing severe inflation. And we're seeing the market prices just go completely out of control. And then he breaks the fourth seal. And it says, a, um, it's, we, we call it a pale horse, but it's actually a, like a sickly yellow horse comes riding out, and the rider on it is death, and it says hell or Hades is following with him. And he's been given authority to wipe out a fourth of the earth, to kill by all sorts of ways, by famine, by plague, by warfare. Even wild beasts start to turn against a population, and even they start to kill people. And then as the, as the fifth seal is broken, something changes. It's no longer the horseman. Now John has another vision of heaven. He sees the altar of God and beneath the altar are the martyrs, people who have died for the word of God. And as they're under this altar, they're calling out to God for when they're going to be avenged. When are they going to get the vengeance for the people that killed them for preaching the word of God? But The martyrs are only given a white robe and they're told to wait until the numbers will be complete. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to tell you what these horses mean. Okay? Because I don't know. We've studied these for 2,000 years. When I say we, as a church, have studied this for 2,000 years. And you can get a lot of opinions from a lot of people. But we still aren't really sure about the specifics of what these horses mean and when this is going to happen and how we can tell it's happening. And I've come to the opinion that we don't understand it because we're not meant to understand these specifics. There was another message that God is presenting us in these mysteries of revelation. And if we focus too much on what these signs mean and when they could happen, and then we, we can speculate, that's fine, I love doing that, but if we focus too much on it, we might forget the bigger picture that God's teaching us. And I believe the bigger picture here is these signs are teaching us and the authority that God is instigating them is showing us that God is the active agent throughout world history. That it's his, by His command and by His authority that some of the biggest events in history happen. It's by His power, it's by His will that human history and human destiny moves forward to the end that God Himself has destined and proclaimed just as important it teaches us that it is through jesus christ and through christ alone that the plan of god is fulfilled and it is not fulfilled without him it is not fulfilled outside of him and it cannot be done without christ so, so you get this scroll and, and, and whatever mystery it contains whatever plan whatever names might be in it whatever it is only christ can reveal it we can't do it the angels can't do it. The elders can't do it. The saints can't do it. There's only one person that can bring about the, the, the plan of God and the will of God through history, and that is Jesus Christ. I'm going to take you for a minute in, in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 says, God has made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure. And listen to this, that He set forth in Christ. He set forth in Christ a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in Him, as in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. The plan of God, it doesn't move without Jesus. The plan of God, the destiny of the world, the fullness of time has Jesus Christ at its center. Whatever is going to be fulfilled, whatever is coming in the specifics, it's all going to be done so in Christ. And when we look at it 
from our perspective here on earth, it looks like chaos. It looks like a bunch of actors are on stage without a script. There's chaos all through. There's war. There's conquest. There's powers being overthrown. There's revolution. There's famine. There's plague. There's economic turmoil. It's crazy. I mean, but does, does it sound familiar? It should because this is human history. Wars, plagues, disasters, conquest, revolutions, periods of great and intense anarchy. For us, it looks like it's out of control. But if we pay attention, if we look with eyes of faith, and if we see and read about His plan beforehand, we find that all of this, all things, work according to the plan of God. There is nothing that is out of His control. There's a lot that is confusing to us. Yes, there is a lot that is mysterious to us. But every bit of this is firmly in God's grasp. And we have the temptation to look at history and think it's out of control. We do the same thing with our life. We do the same thing with our present time now. We're like, God, this is out of control. Do you see what's happening here in our world? Do you see what's going on? We've got gun violence. We've got COVID. We've got people acting crazy, throwing tantrums and airplanes. Lord, what's going on? And we even, in our darkest moments... Even dare to question God. Lord, do you know what's happening here? Do you realize what's going on in this earth? Are you really in control? Our God is not out of control at all. It's all within His grasp. And within grasp of His Son, Jesus Christ, who is the defining power of world history. Yes, it looks chaotic to us at times. But it is all unfolding according to the plan of God. And God's plan is so perfect. I want you to think about this, okay? God's plan is so perfect that He can send actors on a stage without a script. And some of those actors can even rebel against Him. Some of those actors can try to fight the performance. But His plan is so perfect that that performance still goes on exactly like it's supposed to. And more importantly, it ends Exactly like it's supposed to. This past week, Time Magazine unveiled its 100 most influential people of 2021. And if you looked at it, it had most of the same characters we've come to expect. Celebrities, politicians. I think we saw Prince Harry and his wife Meghan Markle there. Little Nas X, a rapper who's real good at stirring up controversy, was in it. Also, uh, Shohei Otani, the baseball phenom for the Los Angeles Angels. Like I said, it's the usual cast of characters, and, and we often look at them as the icons, right? These are the movers and the shakers of our world. These are the influencers of life. These are the men and women that truly move world history. Or so it seems. But what we're taught with this passage today and all throughout the book of Revelation, as the seals are broken, as the plan of God progresses, we know that all these powers are nothing but a flash in the pan. They're a passing fad. And for all their power, the power basically equates to an ant pile trying to stand up to a lawnmower. We see When these seals break and as they open and we see God working in history, not only are we going to see that our most powerful icons and powerful institutions are just brushed aside, we also will see that this is the irresistible advance of the work of God. On the surface, it looks different. On the stage, it might look different. It's the powerful and the famous, the icons, the beautiful, the celebrities. Today we get a glimpse of the backstage. We find it's not the earthly powers at all that are in charge of our world. It is the will of God. It is the plan of God 
unrolling like a scroll. Whatever is written on this scroll here, whatever is written and sealed with seven seals, this is the will of God. And the message it gives us today is it will be done. Our God is the great director. Our God is the one working behind the stage with His elders, with His angels, with His church. And most of all, through His Son, Jesus Christ. Working for the great revealing of history. For the pinnacle of His work. What it is revealing is, well, it's still a mystery to us. We still wait for its completion. But we, you and I, all the people of God, we get to wait with a special anticipation. We get to wait with hope. Because we know God is behind it all. To God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.